we're at the tail end of a series we've uh, entitled Fixing Us. And if you're joining us for the first time uh, this morning, I you know, apologize. You're kind of at the end of the movie and you've missed a lot of the plot. Um, we'll catch you up as much as we can. And I'm sure you'll get a lot out of, out of this morning's message. But I'd highly encourage you to download the podcast of the previous uh, messages and, and they're free and, and listen to them to catch you up. We're talking about relationships, marriages in particular. This series is not just for those who are married. These principles apply to everybody wherever they're at. So if you're single, don't go tune out and say, oh, this is not going to apply to me. It very much does apply to you for your future relationships and your current relationships as well. Last Sunday, I made a few bold statements uh, we talked about and, and I apologize as you know as a pastor um, for how the church and and pastors and religious leaders in the past have elevated in our society we've elevated divorce above pretty much every other sin and to the degree where you know we have counseled and told people that you know, no matter what you're going through in your relationship, stick it out. We've elevated divorce above adultery and abuse and neglect. And that, you know, if, you know, for a woman going through abusive relationship and you've been counseled, stick it out no matter what. God hates divorce. Divorce is not the sin above all sins. That abuse is not tolerated by God and it is not, you know, in those situations, it's, it's not a matter of sticking it out no matter what. I made that statement and if you don't believe me or going, well, wait, I've never heard that. You got to listen to last week's message. The Bible very clearly speaks about all of that. But the, one of the statements that I made last week that is based on the scripture in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. We'll look at it again. It's, it says this, it says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And, and this, this scripture, not necessarily talking about marriages, but yet it's talking about every relationship. It does indicate that there are some times where it would be not impossible, that the word if is a big, big word. Small word, but big. If it is possible, meaning there's times where it's not possible. But it also says, and we looked at this at the end of last week's message, as far as it depends on you, that you and I have a responsibility regardless of the impossibilities. We still have a responsibility of what we can do and what we shouldn't do. We also looked at the very confused, wisest man who ever lived. <laughs> confused, I say that because, I mean, yes, Solomon's the wisest man who ever lived, no question about it, the Bible talks about that, you know, it's very clear. But Solomon said in, in, in the book of Proverbs, he, he's kind of schizophrenic here a little bit, um, he says, we looked at this last week, do not answer a fool according to his folly or you yourself will be just like him. And then the very next verse he says, well, answer a fool according to his folly or he'll be wise in his own eyes. So it's like, Solomon, help me out here. What is it? Don't or do? Uh, don't or do, don't. Or when do I not and when do I do? And this is where we talk about as far as the possibilities in our relationships if I've got a responsibility, I've got a responsibility to not answer to a fool according to his folly. I have a responsibility to answer to a fool according to his folly. And how do I figure out when to do what and how to do each? And I, I made a statement last week at the end of the message that probably is, I mean, you probably didn't believe. Um, in fact, I, I probably don't believe it quite uh, yet, although it's true. The mark of a good fight, this is what I said, the mark of a good fight is when you turn to each other rather than away from each other. Now, the reason why I don't believe that, because I mean, how many of you think that's possible? It, 
<laughs> I mean, I'm in the middle of a fight. I've never thought, you know what? I really love you. I want to turn towards you. I'm, I'm drawn to you in the middle of this. This fight's turning me on. I mean, <laughs> I've never had that problem. I, I don't know if you, you know what? I mean, let's the spark our marriage. Let's just have a good fight. We'll be drawn together. <laughs> I mean, it's truth, but how does, this, how does this work? I mean, fights do the opposite. They kind of pull you away. I mean, that's, that's just natural. They pull you away. They, 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 beca- they create this distance, whether the distance be silence or the distance be, you know, verbally louder. I mean, whatever that distance is, fights don't generally pull together. But the mark of a good fight is actually when we're drawn together. How do we do that? And we take these scriptures. How do we answer a fool when we're supposed to? And how do, when do we know not to? And how do we fight to be pulled together? And I told you that this week I would tell you how. And so we're going to look at how. And, and I don't know if, if you're like me. I'm sure you are. But I, I learn best by example. That means it, I learn best by watching somebody uh, make a mistake and going, oh, I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, and, and I also learn best by watching somebody do something right and going, man, I really want to do that. that that's very good. I, and I learn best by example. And so this morning, I want to look at, at, at a kind of an obscure little story in, in the life of David, King David, as many of us know. But this is much before he became a king. And I, I want to look at this story because in this story, it's in the, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Samuel 25. Because in this story, I want you to see this story. Because in this story, we're going to learn amazing principles as it comes to fighting, as it comes to conflict, as it comes to, to this idea of when to answer a fool and when not to answer a fool. And in particular, by looking at this example, this scripture becomes a whole lot, makes a lot more sense. And, and it applies to our relationships and our marriages and going, how do I respond to, to my spouse in such a way when they're acting the fool or when I'm acting the fool, how should they respond to me and when do I answer them and how do I answer them and, and what do we do and how do we fight and how do we confront uh, uh, the, you know, the fool when we need to so they're not wise in their own eyes because I don't know, us guys are a little stubborn sometimes and if you know, one of the ways that, that you know, some, some people respond to a fool is they just shut down and they just, they're quiet because some of us are more afraid, that's not me, I'm not going to include me in that, that's not me, but some of you are, are, are more afraid of confrontation than you are of anything else and so to, to confront, I'm not going to confront and we're more afraid to confront than anything else and because we, you know, if we confront then, then, then oh no, this is, uh, so I'll just put up with the fool, I'll put up with that because I'm more afraid, I, I, it's more painful for me to actually think about confronting and telling him what's irritating me, telling her what's irritating me than it is to just put up with it, so I'll just put up with it. But here's the problem, when we put up with it after a long time, eventually that's not good and he keeps on thinking, well, he's not doing anything wrong so he keeps escalating and takes it to another level and it just gets worse and worse and worse and so not confronting is is not right but but confronting in the wrong way is not right either so how do we manage this how do we do this how can we confront and fight in such a way that actually pulls us closer together and builds our relationship that's what we want to learn and I think the best story one of the best stories in the Bible is this one in first Samuel verse 25 we're going to pick up the story in in verse 1. We're going to go through 42 verses this morning, so buckle your seatbelts. We're going to go through them quickly, so don't worry about that. But uh, we're going to look at the story. I want you to see the story because so much rich detail in this story that really, really will help all of us. All right, look at this. Then David moved down into the desert of Paran, and he, a certain man in Maon um, who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. Okay, so we're introduced to a couple characters here. Uh, verse 3 goes on and says, says that uh, his name was Nabal, the rich guy in, in the land of Maon and, and and Peron, his, and his, his rich guy's name was Nabal. His wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman. Now, whenever the Bible describes somebody, and we looked at this in the last series, whenever the Bible, the Bible describes Rachel as extraordinarily beautiful, and it, it, it describes Leah, this, Rachel's sister, as having a good personality. <laughs> that, that usually means something. When you leave something out, 
And, you know, Joseph got, or Jacob got tricked into that. But, but no, no, look at this. How it describes Abigail is that she didn't have just a good personality. She was very intelligent and beautiful. I mean, this is, this is an amazing woman. But her, this is written by a prophet, which I'm trying to figure out why he paid attention to that. But anyway, um, but her husband was surly. I love that word. How many of you use that word ever? Say to your spouse, you're just being surly. <laughs> Say to your wife, you're just surly right now. I mean, it's a funny word, I, I, but anyway, it's not good. <laughs> Her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite, which apparently, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the correlation, but basically it's indicating that if you're surly and mean, you're probably a Calebite. All of them are like that, which makes me think, how intelligent is this woman if she's ma- marrying a Calebite who is typically surly? But you have to understand culture. So culture in this, in this day and age, Abigail is not exactly, is not, doesn't exactly have a choice in these days. You know, Abbott, you don't choose the man you're going to marry. If you're a woman, you get bought. And, and a rich guy comes up to your, your dad and, and, and offers, you know, some sheep, and you go home and, and you are his wife. And now, to make matters worse, you marry a surly and mean guy in this culture, you, you don't have the opportunity, even if he's surly and mean towards you and, and, and abusive towards you, you don't, there's no choice for a woman to divorce. A woman doesn't divorce her husband, ever. Women don't divorce husbands. Only husbands divorce wives. And this is why when Jesus was confronted about divorce, he spoke something quite different and spoke into something much, much, much different. By the way, if you're not a Christian, I just, I just say this, if you're not a Christian yet and you don't under, you're checking out this Christianity thing, one of the proofs to me that Jesus is, is God and, and that Christianity is far different than any other religion, pay attention to me, Christianity, listen to me carefully, Christianity in, in as any other religion in the world is the only religion that elevates the status of women. You ever notice that? That in Christian societies, Women are elevated. You go into, into other religions, any other religion, women, just saying. But in this day, in this day, Abigail, intelligent, was married to a guy. She has no choice. She's married to this surly, mean Nabal. Verse goes on. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep, so he sent ten young men and said to them, go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Now, I got to, to make this make sense, I got to backtrack the story a little bit. This is before David becomes king. You see, David, at this point in in his life, he's he's in between age 17 and 30. He becomes king at, at age 30, but in between that time, David, at 17 years old, we see his life. He kills Goliath and becomes so famous, so elevated, so popular that that all of all of the Israelites begin to celebrate and make heroes of and idolize David as the mightiest warrior maybe ever in the nation of Israel and they elevate him and they make him so popular Saul the king becomes jealous of 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 David's popularity forces him out chases him into the wilderness this is where we find David David running away from Saul the idea is David knows everybody in Israel everybody in Israel knows who David is the reason why David's on the run right now is because everybody knows who he is and so David knows that well, well all of Saul's cronies and all his followers and and Saul's household and all the rest of it, Saul's guys, all of Saul's guys, they're the only ones that don't like David. But everywhere else, everyone loves David. Everybody does. And so when David goes and he says, man, he's here in the wilderness somewhere and he's saying, he's noticing it's sheep shearing time. So he says to this guy, go up to him and greet him in, in my name. He's not being arrogant. He just knows. Everybody knows who David is. Is. That's important because he's, look at this, this is what he says. He tells these guys, go to them and say, say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household and good health to all that is yours. Okay? That's great. That's a great greeting. If I were you, um, don't skip down to the story yet, but if I were you, I would underline or bracket that verse because this verse comes in, you know, a little bit key in, in a few 
moments here. But look at this, because this, he says to him, this is great. I mean, David's greeting him and saying, long life to you, good health to you and your household. This is a good greeting and good health to all that is yours. So this is, now he goes on to the next verse in verse 7. It says, now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. He's still telling his, his followers what to tell them. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them, and the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Now, what David is talking about is David is, is running from Saul. And if you know the rest of the story, the story is that David you know, escapes by himself initially. But eventually, the Bible says that a whole bunch of disgruntled and distressed men and, and rebels all join themselves to David and saying, we're going to run with you. Now, it's one thing to hide in a cave by yourself with you and your little family, but David had 600 men and their families all attached them, themselves to him, making it a whole lot more difficult to hide. That's a big cave. I mean, 600, and then they didn't just have one wife and, and two children. They, they had multiple wives and, you know, dozens of children and now he's got to hide all of these people and so David had to keep on a move now while David's on the move scholars tell us that David's on the move he's, he's around this this land this you know land of uh you know Peron and all the rest of it. he was probably circling around and keeping on the move around Nabal's property Nabal is rich 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 has lots of land and and we see that 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 David as he's going around what he's probably doing is that he's probably protecting you know, this guy that anybody, and what is typical in these days, you know, is that the only way to get wealth is to rob somebody else and to get wealthy. And if you had a lot of wealth, you had a lot of men to protect you and to protect your stuff because guys would typically come in and protect. And David is making sure, hey, I'm here. I've never attacked you, never taken, even though it's common practice, I've never taken a thing from you. In fact, I've even protected you from other people trying to take things from you. So this is what David's saying. Verse 7, that plays a part later on. Ask your own servants and they will tell you that what I'm telling you is true. Therefore, be favorable towards my men. Since we have come at a festive time, please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. Now, before you think David is a mooch um, and it's kind of rude, this is not untypical in this day and age it's it's not normal for us today for someone to knock on our door and saying hey you don't know me i'm a perfect stranger i'm just traveling through but could i have some food and and you know your coat and men um you know a pair of jeans would be good and um actually that couch over there could i have that that'd be awesome you we'd be looking at them and saying yeah, no <laughs> go away you know weirdo what's going on but <laughs> But to, in this day and age, it was not abnormal for, for transients or people that were on the move to find somebody and, and say to them, you know, and, and could you share a little bit with me? And it was actually, it was, it was typically, you know, it was normal for, for guys when they do that. Of course, you can have something. We see this even in the stories of Jesus where, you know, knock, you know, knock on your neighbors. Who's going to say, you know, late at night and give me some, you know, flour, some bread. That's not typically what we do in practice today. But yet in this Jewish culture, this is exactly what they would typically do is just share with, and it would be normal to share so David's not asking something outrageous or you know strange this is really quite normal now look at the story when David when David's men arrived verse 9 they gave Nabal this message in David's name then they waited and that's a long you know that's the part of the problem with reading a story is we don't know how long they waited but when you typically come to somebody and greet somebody in the name it's not normal for them to make you wait they would normally come out right away they waited which is a little bit of disrespectful you know you know irritating disrespectful but okay we can look past this but then look at Nabal's answer verse 10 Nabal answered David's servants who is this David <laughs> oh, um the guy's probably a little taken back you know dude turn on the news like he's all over the news uh, you know people are singing songs about him uh, I mean the entire you know everybody's what do you mean you don't know who, who David is but then look at this, this I mean he could play dumb until he says who's the son of Jesse wait 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 you know his dad but you don't know him you know whose son he is 
You know his ancestry, fool, but you don't. Okay, okay, okay. What, 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 what are you saying here? Who is this son? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Oh, oh you do know who he is. You're assuming that, okay, that, that he's a rebel because he's not with Saul. Okay. Now, here's the problem. This is, this is, this is an issue. This is, a, this is a problem. The problem is, is that when you question a man's integrity and you question a man's identity, that's disrespectful. Nabal's disrespecting David greatly here. And, and here's the issue. This is what, how it applies. This is where the story applies to, to you and me. Is disrespect is a relationship killer. Disrespect is deadly when it comes to marriages and relationships of any kind, not just in marriages, but relationships of any kind. But disrespect doesn't happen overnight. Disrespect, you just don't disrespect somebody. Disre- Let me tell you how the process works, because if you understand what the process works, then you'll understand its problem. See, disrespect starts off as a complaint. And a, pl- a complaint unchecked becomes contempt. And contempt unchecked becomes disrespect. And disrespect is the killer. And, and we'll see this. We, the moment you disrespect, so what I mean by this is in, in our relationships, in our marriages, you know, we get into this place where we're madly in love and, all, and, all, and then all of a sudden the honeymoon period wears off or something goes on and you begin to live with somebody and you see something and you have something, you're going, that's not something I really like and I don't really like it when they do that or when they say that or when they kind of behave this way and ah, it kind of irritates, uh, you know, it's a little different than I would do. And, uh, and then all of a sudden it breeds this little complaint and we begin to complain a little bit about, we have this little complaint about our spouse, and if we leave that unchecked and we don't deal with it in some way, or don't confront it in some way, don't confront them in some way, just, just leave it there, it can easily grow into contempt. And contempt is where it's, we become resentful for the other person. We begin, we begin to question their, who they are and what they mean and their motives. And, and this is what is typical that happens is that we begin to question, isn't it true that, that the people that are closest to us and the people that, that we're closest to, isn't it easiest to question their motives? And we do it all the time, and we attack their motives, and we judge their motives. And Jesus said, it's dangerous to judge someone's motives. That actions is one thing. You can judge actions, but judging motives, that's a deadly thing. And we get to this this place of contempt, and we begin to judge and attack and, and hit at their motives, which Nabal's doing with David here. And as soon as we begin to attack motives we begin to become disrespectful, and we begin to disrespect, and we're disrespect is a killer. Now, it goes on. We'll, we'll see that a little bit more, but I want you to see that this is, this is a major, major problem in this relationship, Nabal and David's relationship. Now, now watch. He, go, he goes on. He just doesn't stop here disrespecting. He goes on. And he goes, why should I take my bread and my water and the meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? By the way, I live in the land of my own, and my stuff is my own. Sorry. Um. <laughs> but I mean, no, no, he's like, he said, look, look, no, no, I've got my stuff. My stuff is my stuff. Don't come asking me about my stuff. And this is where I begin to, I begin to see a little bit. Now, I don't know Nabal's motives. But I'm guessing because disrespect, disrespecting a guy like David is not normal. Right away. And this, David is is here heralded as the, the greatest warrior. To disrespect him, you don't just automatically meet somebody for the first time and disrespect them. There's got to be something going on here. So you, you look at the process. There had to be a complaint. Now, no, I'm, just, I'm just seeing this, all the stuff that I have slaughtered and the bread that I did. did, did all, I, I'm just guessing. Just, no, I'm just, I'm just guessing. But I'm guessing that Nabal, who's a wealthy man, is looking at this young punk kid and saying, okay, wait, I know you're all David and you're all famous and you're all awesome. All you did is, is take a slingshot and knock out a giant. Okay? 
cool, woo, one, one event, and now you're all popular. Now you got all this, and now people are following you and, and singing songs about you. But you don't know where I've been. You don't know where I, where I came from. My, my family, I'm wealthy, but my dad wasn't wealthy. I can, you don't know where I came from. I had to make all this stuff my, uh, my own. I had to do all this stuff by myself. Raise, make all, I had to work hard to get what I want. And now you, just because you're you, just because you, okay, you, you knocked out, cool. But one event, when you're 17 years old, probably luck, now you think you can come and take from me all the stuff that I'm doing. I'm just getting, because he had this little complaint about David. Look at David getting all this popularity. He did nothing. Became contempt to the point where now he's disrespecting David and saying, no, 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 no. Contempt never solves a problem, nor does it lead to reconciliation. And in fact, contempt is the catalyst of greater conflict to come. Just wait. Contempt is a catalyst. Bigger conflict. Now look, 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 this is this is my favorite part of the story. Is David's men turned around and went back, and when they arrived, they reported every word. I bet they did. <laughs> they came back to David and said, Oh, David, you should hear what he said about you. What else did he say? <laughs> he said, I mean, you should heard, look at this, what else did he said? You should hear what he said about you. You should, you should have heard what he called you. Oh, David, David. David. I mean, we're, did we miss anything? You know, did we, did we miss anything? No, no, we didn't miss anything. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. He, he also said, you know, he, he, who is this son of Jesse? I mean, they told him every word. Now look at David's response. David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword. <laughs> And in the words of Russell Peters, somebody about to get to hurt her real bad. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know who Russell Peters is, bless you, bless you, bless you. It's awesome, bless you, bless you. Just keep it that way. I, I, I don't know it either, I just heard. Anyway. <laughs> Each of you strap on your swords. So they did, and David strapped on his as well. Ooh, oh, this is going to be good. About 400 men went up with David while 200 stayed with the supplies. <laughs> now, next scene. Cuts to the next scene. While this is all going on, these guys are strapping on their swords. Someone's about to get hurt. <laughs> you right? Verse 14. One of the servants told Abigail, remember Nabal's wife, the intelligent, beautiful one, okay, David sent messengers from the, the wilderness give us our, you know, to give us our master's greetings, but, they hur- but he hurled insults at him. Yet, these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was ever missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us. The whole time we were herding our sheep near them. In fact, we knew they were there, and they never once took advantage of us. In fact, we never had to deal with lions or wolves or, or robbers or anything. Well, these guys were around us because everywhere around us, they protected us. We know they protect us. And, and he came, and, and, and now your husband is hurling insults at him. And they, and they continue on. The servant continues on and says, Now, think it over and see what you can do. <laughs> That's always the women. Have to start. Anyway, Think, see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. Wow. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. And this is, this is, uh, there's a huge, 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 huge truth in this verse. God, I want you to see something. That this is huge. No one can talk to him. This is by very definition. Remember last week we, we learned about Three different types of people. We learned, you know, Solomon talks about the naive, which are the ones that just don't know what they don't know, and we all enter relationships naive, just don't know what we don't know. Solomon also talks about the fool who knows better but chooses to do it anyway. That's a fool. We also learned about the mocker and scoffer who's a fool, I mean, knows better, does it anyway, but then blames everybody else for when things don't go well. Now, a fool in this way, is one that, I mean, you can't tell a mocker or scoffer 
anything. You can't correct them. You can't tell them anything because they won't listen to anybody. And, this, and, and a fool is the same way. They just don't refuse to listen to anybody. And this is, this is the key truth in this. Is that unteachableness results in disaster hanging over your house. This is, this, listen, you gotta, you gotta, because some of you need to under, hear this and understand this, that unteachableness, if we can't, if nobody can tell us anything, nobody can challenge us anything, nobody can, no, we don't, you don't listen to friends who are saying, ah, warning, 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 be careful, be careful, you won't listen to anything else, I mean, won't listen to anybody, unteachableness, the result of that is disaster is hanging over your house. Disaster can come. And, and here's, the, here's the thing. It's over your household and his whole household. Because Solomon says this, remember we looked at this verse last week, that the companion of fools suffer harm. That is not just the fool that suffers the harm, but the companion that everybody associated with the fool ends up suffering as well. And this guy, is, this servant's paying attention to this and sees this and says, we can't, you, you, you got, I mean, you got to talk to him, you got to do something because he doesn't listen to anybody, he doesn't listen to us, he doesn't listen to anybody. And because of that, disaster is hanging over the house. Now, look at Abigail. Abigail's awesome. Abigail acted quickly. That's, underline that. It didn't just sit there and stew and go, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? She acted quickly because that plays a big role. She, she you know, disaster's hanging over our household. If we don't do something, she acted quickly. So she took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, Five, whatever that is. I had to look that up. I was like, I had no idea what that is. That's about 60 pounds worth of grain. Okay, that's what that means. Okay, five, that things, of roasted grains, 60 pounds. 100 cakes of raisins and 200 cakes of pressed figs and loaded them on a donkey. And this is the key. Not only does, does Abigail going to say that she's going to do something, she acts on it. By the way, this is, this is, this is the key. Don't, you know... Husbands and wives, listen, don't just say you love your spouse. Don't just say you're sorry. Don't just say that, that you're going to change. Don't just say, you got to act on it too. Respect is not just, you know, I keep it inside. Respect is not just, I, I'm changing. Respect is not just keeping to yourself. Respect is acting on it. That's, that's part of honor. You got to act on it. You got to actually show change. And she's showing, she's, I mean, she took all of this for David's men. She's acted quickly, took all this. She's acting. Now, she's not just going to say, David, I'm sorry. She's going to show. It's huge. Then she told her servants, verse 19, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. Uh oh. <laughs> Sometimes. It's best to leave the fool in the dark. Just saying. Okay, but she did not tell her husband. As she came riding her Escalade into a mountain ravine, just want to make sure you're paying attention, okay? It's rich, remember? Okay, that's the type of donkey. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, were, there were David and his men descending towards her, and she met them. Now, now, now remember, when they're descending towards her, they're all strapped up for war. Okay, <laughs> look at this. David had just said, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that I have nothing of his is missing. And he has paid back evil for good. And this is always what we do. Every one of us do this. I, I, you, I need you to see this. All of us do this. We begin to justify why we're right. We have to, David's saying, I mean, he's, he's, wow, well, he's strapped up for war. I can't believe this guy. It's been useless watching over this thing. And he's, he's spouting off as to why he, you know, it's okay to go and kill this guy and all his men. And he's got, he's justifying and telling himself. And if you start having to convince yourself that you're right and that what you're doing is right, probably warning flags, warning, 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 probably what you're doing is talking yourself into something that's not right. We're the best salesmen to ourselves, aren't we? We can talk ourselves into anything, justify anything. And if you're justifying yourself and telling yourself why it's okay for me to do that and I'm just going to do this anyway because I can't believe what she said and I can't believe I'm just going to go and do So I'm going to show her. I'm going to show him. And, da, da, da. and we get into this thing. If you get into that, this is what David's doing. Warning. Problem. And David's doing this. 
And, and this is what we learned last week is that David is justifying. He's basically saying, I'm right, so therefore I'm justified to fight. I'm right, so I fight. And this is where we get it. I'm right, so I fight. And he goes on. He, 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 I mean, not only does he just talk himself into it, but man, he's got he's to get spiritual now and bring God into this. Watch this. May God deal with David. <laughs> First person. David, pay attention. May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. Exclamation mark. Ticked off. Somebody about to get hurt. Right? May God deal with me. If I don't, I'm going to bring God in this. (laughs) Just right. Man. (laughs) We've come a long way. From verse 6, haven't we? Verse 6, long life to you, good health, may everything you touch prosper. I'm going to kill them all. (laughs) It's a big difference. We've come a long way in a few verses. Okay, this is a big change. Okay, that's why I wanted you to highlight verse 6. This is, you see what disrespect does, it just flips somebody long life we wish them well and i love you no this is going to be great to uh, flip the switch kill them all (laughs) now when abigail saw david she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before david with her face to the ground (laughs) the key to avoiding contempt lies in managing our disagreements without losing respect for each other. Now, just watch, watch. This is so key. What Abigail does here is amazing. You need to see this. The key to avoiding contempt lies in, remember, as, as, if it is possible, as far as it's concerned to me, the, the, the ability to manage our disagreements help us avoid contempt but we got to do it without losing disrespect and the first thing she does is she bows down before David with her face to the ground and look at this look no no what she, she gets better she says she fell at his feet and said pardon your servant my lord David's not her lord look at the respect and let me speak to you hear what your servant has to say now this is Solomon, we, were, we started with that verse, you know, don't answer a fool according to a fool. What David is doing right now, what David is preparing for, he's answering a fool according to a fool, the way a fool would. I'm right, so I got to fight. And he's answering. And yet Abigail, in the midst of the same, in the same conflict, conflict, and she still confronts David, she answers differently. And this is where Solomon says, don't answer a fool like David did according to a fool, but answer a fool like Abigail did. Abigail, the way you answer a fool is with respect. Now look at how she does this with respect. But he doesn't deserve respect. She doesn't deserve respect. How could I possibly respect him? You don't know what he did. You don't know what she did. Look at, look at, look at, look at how she, she teaches us how to do this. Look at she says, please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. That's her husband. He is just like his name. His name means fool. Thanks, Mom. (laughs) And folly goes with him. That wherever you fool, folly, disaster follows. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. Now the first thing she does, and this is how you answer a fool, if somebody attacks you and this is how you do it with respect, the first thing you do is, is you acknowledge your shortcomings just like she did. She acknowledged her shortcoming. In this case, her shortcoming was her husband. She took responsibility and said, man, man, I'm, you know, he was wrong. How he treated you, he acted just like his name means, fool. And she, she learned to express you know, her shortcomings and she, we need to do this, learn to express your disagreement without putting your opponent on the offensive. 
And, and a way to do this is she says, I. She starts off the, the conversation by, she doesn't say, David, you, what you're doing right now, and I see those weapons, and what you're about to do is terrible, and she could have confronted him that way, and she would have got the same response probably that her husband was about to get. And yet she, she begins the conversation by saying, you. And when we get into arguments and get into fights, we typically start by, by justifying ourselves, even to them, and attack and saying, you hurt me. You did this. You always. You never. And instead, the way to answer a fool, the way to do it is, is with respect and saying, I, I played a role. I, I, I'm acknowledging my shortcomings. I'm acknowledging my part in this thing. Because what that does is that the, the response to that is amazing. Solomon said it. A, sh- a soft answer turns away wrath. David is in the, f- in, f- in, he's, furious he's I mean he's foaming at the mouth he's furious about to ready to kill everybody and yet she responds and said yeah you know we're our bad we're bad now she goes on and now my lord as surely as the lord your god lives and as you live she brings David back to remember the lord your god the one you love so much, the one I heard about that you, that you worship, you know, as a shepherd boy, the one that I heard you, you I mean, you were, didn't you once, weren't you once the, the worship leader, the minstrel for, for Saul and his kingdom? I mean, I know you know him and love him, the Lord, your God. I mean, you have a relationship, bring, bring that back. Lives, and as long as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed, God's kept you from bloodshed, he, he, he's going, what do you mean? I'm, I'm just on my way. What do you mean, kept me? And from avenging yourself with your own hands, and she brings back and says, oh, remember your relationship with God. And this one, is she's confronting him and saying, yeah, but what you're about to do is you're, you're justifying yourself. You're avenging yourself. You're not letting God avenge you. You're avenging yourself. I mean, that's confrontation. This is bold. With your own hands. May your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. She appeals to David's passion and brings God back into the picture, reminding him that he's avenging himself. And now she goes on, look at this. And let this gift, I'm not just saying I respect you, I'm showing I respect you, which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the men who follow you. And then she says, please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. This is huge. Look what she did. She acknowledged first. She appeals. She confronts him and, and, and slips in there telling him that he's avenging himself. But then she begins to speak to who he's called to be, not what he's currently acting as. This is amazing. She's being crystal clear about what she's confronting without being judgmental. She's speaking to the, to the man he is, to his character, and to who he's about to become, not to the actions of how he's currently acting. David's currently acting like a fool. And she's saying, you are going to be a great, mighty king who won't make wrong who won't do wrong as long as you live and you've got a great dynasty david is a you know is an outcast there's no kingship and yet she's speaking to who he is who he's called to be and even though she goes on even though someone is pursuing you to take away your life the life of my lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the lord your god that god is in in control david god is in control but the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as as from the pocket of a sling and now this is amazing because what she's doing here is she's quoting it. If you, if you recognize this and this sounds familiar, it's because this is, I mean, she understands David so well that, that she's quoting very similar to how he would later write the entire book of Psalms as to who his source is and the living God is going to help him overcome his enemies and what you read most in the book of Psalms. She's appealing right to his very heart and very nature. John, John Gottman, who, who wrote a great book on, on marriage, Seven Principles of Lasting Marriage, said this, human nature dictates that it is virtually impossible to accept advice from somebody unless you feel that that person understands you. 
that it's virtually impossible to accept advice from somebody unless you feel that that person understands you. And what she's doing is she's appealing to David who he's called to be, but who his heart really is. And she's showing that she, while her husband says, I don't know that man, she's showing, man, she does know this guy. And she understands him and what makes him tick. And because of that, he listens. Now look at, when the Lord... She goes on, when the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel. She's prophesying. I mean, what Samuel did was kind of in private. Nobody really knows what's going on. We know the story, but she doesn't know. But yet she's prophesying into, you're going to be the next ruler, the next king. This is who you're called to be, David. You're called to be great. You've got greatness in you. John Gottman also said this in in the book. He says, people can change only if they feel that they are basically liked and accepted as they are. People can change only if they feel that they are basically liked and accepted as as they are. Respect. That if I feel like you respect me, I'm more apt to listen and more apt to change. That respect is, is powerful powerful bonding tool in a relationship it is the tool no, no, look at she goes on verse 31 my lord will not have on his conscience while you're the great king the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself and when the lord your god has brought my lord success remember me remember your servant hmm. now if either you or your spouse feels judged, misunderstood, or rejected by the other, you will not be able to manage the problem in your marriage. The moment you feel judged and misunderstood, rejected, it becomes impossible to manage. And yet, she's speaking to you. David, no, no, watch this. Watch David's response when confronted this way. And David said to Abigail, praise be to the Lord. Now he's going to pray. Now he's going to bring God into the picture. The God of Israel who has sent you today to meet me, may you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. And what he does in, immediately when he sees he's wrong, he acknowledges he's wrong. And the way that he got confronted is he, David was going to confront a fool the way the fool would, as Solomon said, don't do. But yet Abigail confronted David acting the fool and David became david wisely said man i I was wrong i was yeah you're right i was going to avenge my own and he acknowledged his guilt now verse 34 otherwise as surely as the lord the god of israel lives who has kept me from harming you if you had not come quickly to meet me not one male belonging to nabal would have been left alive by daybreak then david accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said go home in peace I have heard your words and granted your request and David changes his mind and changes his entire stance because of how Abigail confronted him with respect this is this is so key this is Solomon David's son later penned these words and this is your memory verse for the week the death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or life. Now, in the case of Abigail, literally, life and death was in the power of her tongue. How she confronted David would depend on whether she would live or not, whether her household would live or not. Life and death was, now in your situation, it might not be so dire, it not, might not be a life and death situation, but yet you can speak life to your marriage or death to your marriage, all in how you respond when one or the other of you acts like a fool. And that the key bonding agree, uh, thing that you need to fight for in your marriage, the number one key ingredient in your marriage is respect. And that's today's takeaway. Just for fun, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Tis the bond between you and me. (laughs) 
okay? Respect is the bond between you and I. It's the bond that the moment that we allow complaint to become contempt, to become disrespect, the moment we do that, the whole thing begins to fall apart and becomes disastrous. That we need to fight for respect. Now, though disagreements may be present in your marriage, and I guarantee you that you're going to have disagreements, that's, respect is going to offset any potential Destruction, that the way that we can fight and pull together is if we maintain respect. Now, if you're not sure, this, this is a confrontation. Look at how this confrontation, potentially disastrous confrontation, bonded David and Abigail together. Because this is the rest of the story. And this is, so, this is kind of funny, actually. But look at the rest of the story. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was a fool's per- are pretenders they like to pretend there's something they're not which is why he was jealous but anyway he was in high spirits and very drunk and so she said nothing at him until the daybreak she's wise she understands when to confront and when not to look at the next verse this is awesome then in the morning when Nabal was sober his wife told him all the things that she had done all the things that all this whole thing that happened with David And his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. I don't know what that means, but it ain't good. Okay, his heart gave out. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. (laughs) Wow. What's amazing in this one is that the the psalmist says, the companion and fool suffer harm. But because wisdom entered in the picture, because Abigail entered with wisdom, the companions were saved, and the fool suffered the harm. Now watch, this is, this is where it gets fun. When David had heard that Nabal was dead, he said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I love the Bible. <laughs> praise be the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail asking him to become or asking her to become his wife. <laughs> and you wonder why what? Okay, what? No, let's look at this. Is what I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on in David's head. David, look at this confrontation. This confrontation actually pulled them together to where David so admired Abigail because of her wisdom and, the, and her respect. And, and he looked at this, and in the confrontation, he, he realized that she was calling to a me that I haven't even seen yet. She was speaking to me about my destiny that I haven't even witnessed yet, I haven't even seen, that she saw the real me, the real potential in me, and I need that person by my side. I want that woman as that woman needs to be my wife. She confronted me when I was about to make a mistake. She wasn't afraid of me. She wasn't, she wasn't disrespectful to me. She, she, didn't, she didn't diss me because I was doing something stupid. She called out the goodness in me and I need that person by me. And it's possible in confrontation to have that. Now, that's what I think. And then, and then the Bible goes on to say this and it says... His servants went down to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to take you to become his wife. And she, look at her response, she bows down with her face to the ground and said, I am your servant and ready to serve you and wash the feet of my Lord's servant. I'm thinking, no wonder David wanted this woman. (laughs) She's going to serve him and wash his car too. (laughs) Wow. Wow. And while all the women are thinking, and husbands are going, nudge, 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 nudge. Look at that, look at that. Look at that. Just kidding. I want a woman like that too. No, just kidding. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> Verse 42, and Abigail quickly got on a donkey and attended by her five female servants, went with David's messengers and became his wife. Wow. What we learn from this story is in our relationships, this is an example, in our relationships, you can answer a fool because you're right 
and justified to fight and attack just like David wanted to, or you can, you can encounter and confront the fool like Abigail with the wisdom that she did and saying, I acknowledge where I'm wrong, a soft answer turns away wrath, and I'm looking to who you are, not how you're acting right now. And with respect, disarmed the battle. So good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and for stories like these that are, are really amazing and the truth in them are, are simply stunning. And Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us in our relationships where we're at in Jesus' name. That you would help us, Lord God, to identify where we have fallen and where we've acted as a fool. And Lord, help us identify where we have complaints that are we haven't dealt with and contempt that is built up that we haven't dealt with and where we may be disrespecting our spouse. Lord, help us to learn how to deal with that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know, we're not just going to teach you a truth like this and not give you practical tools on how to act this up. One of the things I'd love to do throughout this, this series, we have provided the Love Dare on our Facebook page and website and we encourage you to, if you haven't been following that or paying attention to that, encourage you to do that because what the Love Dare does is it, it teaches you, it gives you an action step to do every single day that will show respect to your spouse but it changes something inside of your heart too when you do that. It's amazing. We also are offering this week and starting Wednesday night, we're offering a, a Bible study called, you know, a, a little small group study that's called Love and Respect, and where you can learn um, amazing truths and principles of how to apply this to your specific relationship and take these principles and apply them now to everyday life. And highly encourage you to come to that. Even if you're single, go to that. Learn some amazing, amazing tools. And that, that, that uh, course is going to be offered on Wednesdays, 7 o'clock here at the church. Pastor John is hosting that. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you need to meet my Jesus. My Jesus is amazing. And, and Jesus doesn't look at us where we are and where we've been. Jesus looks at us as who we're becoming, and he says, I accept you as you are. And he's the ultimate example of respect where he gives you respect and says, I've created you, and this is who I've made you to be. You need to have a relationship with Jesus. You will learn from him more than any any other and one of Jesus's closest followers Paul said this he says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God and in a moment we're going to do that we're going to confess with our mouth that Jesus is God and he says if you do this if you confess with your mouth Jesus is God and you believe what you're confessing in your heart you will be saved so I'm going to lead us in a prayer so powerful let's pray this together and we're going to ask everyone to Repeat this after me. If you're praying this for the first time, pray with all your heart and your meaning right here, right now. You can begin a relationship with Jesus. If you're watching online, pray this prayer with me. And, and uh, let's, let's meet, have a relationship with Jesus. Let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God. And I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to be my God, my Lord, my Savior, my friend. I thank you that you've forgiven all of my sin. That my past is past. And that I can begin a new life with you right now. So I give my heart to you. In Jesus' name, amen.